Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to come and talk to you today. Uh, I've been asked to talk about what you see here, um, violence and conflict trends in Africa, and what I plan to do is give a sort of bird's eye view of 30,000 feet or so, looking at trends of organized violence across the continent for the last 27 years or so, really starting from the um, 1990s onwards. So I'm going to draw from the research that I conducted for my um, book, as you see up here, War and Conflict in Africa, to give an overview of those trends. And, and what I want to do is really say some general points about what's been happening in organized violence across the continent. And I should say at the beginning, yeah, I'm a curious outsider. Uh, I'm a, not a local expert when it comes to any African country, but I study general trends in terms of war and conflict and peacekeeping operations. You're the experts here, obviously, so um, I'd be curious to hear your questions. So I want to say some general points, and then I want to look at elements of what I would see as the sort of context in which violence is occurring at the moment, so the political context that I think is key, and then say some things about elements of continuity and change. I think when we look at warfare and organized violence in Africa at the moment, there are elements that are both very similar across long periods of time, but also some novel developments that I think we need to take into account. And then I'll finish with a few remarks on what this means for peacemaking techniques and uh, peacekeeping operations on the continent at the moment. So that's the, that's the plan. So to start off, if we take a, a sort of zoom out and look at um, trends in organized violence since the 1950s across the, uh, the continent, I'm using here the um, Political Instability Task Force, a, a data set compiled by the, the US government here. We can see a couple of notable trends if we think about organized violence to include not only civil wars, but also campaigns of ethnic cleansing, genocidal violence, and also things like coup d'etat, um, and assassination attempts on leaders. You can see here the broad trends are that we had with the wars of national liberation struggle and during the Cold War, Africa comes to a peak of violence in the early 1990s. And then since the early 1990s, it's been pretty good news and we've seen a major reduction of armed conflicts and organized violence in tandem with more attempts at peace negotiations and peacekeeping operations. But what I want to focus mainly on today is the last few years where we see things getting a bit, a bit worse. And particularly since 2010, all of the violence trends that I'll talk about have been getting worse on the continent rather than, um, rather than better. Now a second general point to make at the beginning is how violence in Africa compares to the rest of the world over this time period. And here I'm drawing on the um, uh, Uppsala conflict database. And they split organized violence into three different types. There are wars between states or state-based um, conflicts involving troops from a government uh, against non-state or interstate um, uh, opponents. Then secondly, there's what they call one-sided violence. That is um, organized campaigns of violence against non-combatants and civilians, genocide, ethnic cleansing, campaigns of um, war crimes and the like. And then thirdly, their category of what they call non-state armed conflicts. That is where all the elements of war are um, apparent, but it doesn't involve troops of governments or states. This is wars between clans or tribal factions or other non-state actors. And if you look at each of those three categories across the world from 1990 to 2014, what I put up here is Africa is marked and shaded in green, and the rest of the world is the, the black and white lines. You can see here that Africa in all of those categories has far more than its fair share of organized violence. So there's big questions about what exactly is going on in terms of African, local, national, and regional politics that explains why Africa sees, in some cases, well over, for example, two-thirds of all the campaigns of one-sided violence uh, in the world since 1989 have occurred on the African continent. Now, if we think spatially and where are those conflicts going on, what I put up here is using a, another database, mapping the trends uh, geographically from the 21st century. Where do we see organized violence? And what I put on this map here are three types of organized violence. Uh, campaigns of violence against civilians in orange. Uh, battles, we all understand what battles are in dark blue. And then thirdly, in light blue, remote violence. Remote violence refers to things where 
the perpetrators of the act can be removed at a distance from where the um, violence is going on. So things like aerial bombardments, artillery bombardments, but in particular now, um, IEDs, improvised explosive devices. And you'll see there that organized violence in the 21st century, the good news story is Southern Africa compared to the 1990s. And it's really the, the trickiest stories in the continent are in North Africa and then the swathe of states from the, um, the Sahel. Now, what, is, what do these figures mean, or what is behind these, these figures? Um, in terms of context, what's going on? As we're going to hear, I think, from um, John in a bit more detail, the first thing I want to say is our collective attempts to understand organized violence in Africa are not that great. I think we miss a lot of what happens. Um, not a lot of it is recorded, or sorry, not all of it is recorded by journalists or other data sets. So our knowledge is, is shaky. Secondly, I think I draw a distinction between what I call the two worlds of, of conflict in Africa, between the state-based and the non-state worlds. I think one set of activities or one type of conflicts we see are those involving African states and their governments. These are for by and for reasons of realpolitik and to do with state politics. But there's a whole other category of armed conflicts that are not about state politics. They're fought either on the peripheries of states, on the margins, in contested borderlands, and they're fought by mainly non-state actors, often about very different things than what I think um, we would think of when we talk about realpolitik. Um, third thing I want to point to in terms of context is just the nature of some of the armed groups themselves. And I think the important point to make is that many of the organized um, uh, violent parties we see on the conflict now, continent now, are what I would call incoherent factions. And what I mean by that is two things. They're, they're incoherent in the sense that they don't always follow a clear sort of Clausewitzian chain of command. These are not all professional military actors and organizations. But also, as relatively decentralized entities, they also rarely have a coherent political program and political message which they're putting forward. And this incoherence leads to problems, as I'll talk about um, in a minute. The fourth point I want to make is um, about the regression of governance indicators. And for that, I need a little bit of help from my friends up here. Um, if you look at the, the trends in armed conflict in Africa, particularly since about 2003, you'll see the indicators of governance, whether this is civil liberties, human rights, um, political rights, since 2003, all of these governance indicators have either stalled or gone backwards. Now, I'm not going to blame everything on the, the heads of state you see up here, but I would blame quite a lot of things uh, on the heads of state you see up here. The, the tattoos are about the years in power, um, and some, as you can see, are much older uh, heads of state than others. But the point I want to make here is that increasingly, I think, our security challenges around organized violence and war are basically in the same areas as our governance challenges and our political challenges in the areas of governance. And so that's why I want to sort of exemplify it with these um, heads of state. I think increasingly um, our governance issues and states where we're worried about transition and what's going to happen after the big man disappears, how violent that might be, increasingly those are going to give us most of our security headaches. And that means, last point of context, is that we've seen both African organizations and the United Nations, the European Union and others are much more willing over the last 15 years or so to deploy really quite robust enforcement operations that go well beyond traditional um, peacekeeping. Now, when I look at the wars across the continent today, I see two elements, basically, elements of continuity and elements of, of change. And what are the main elements of continuity? I would point to four. First, most of what we see in Africa are what Barbara Walter has called repeat civil wars. Most of those groups of states across the Sahel region that I showed, they're, they're suffering from conflicts that are basically very hard to kill off and die out completely. Rebel groups tend to re-emerge and resurge in slightly different forms, but we're seeing basically repetition whether we're talking about Tuaregs in, in Mali or different formations of rebel groups in the Central African Republic or different factions of the SPLA in South Sudan shifting around. Most of what we see today has had previous legacies and previous um, conflict in the past. 
Secondly, I think a key part of the conflict we see at the moment is to do with contested government transitions. Um, what happens in local uh, populations when we have democratic deficits and when there are people basically with grievances about minority rulers of one sort or another, I think this has always been a key issue in thinking about war in Africa and it's still important today. Thirdly, therefore, I think it's very misleading to talk about sort of internal or civil wars um, in the African context because I don't think really almost any of the conflicts, the larger ones we see on the continent, are sealed into one particular state. They're not internal in that sense. They involve rather, I would say, a whole series and levels of dynamics. Some local level politics about particular towns, cities, diamond mines, etc. Some national level politics about who's going to lead the country and the, the sort of national political dynamics. There's always also regional dynamics. What are the neighboring states doing and the different ethnic or other groups that are across the borders? And finally, there's always global dynamics, whether this is the trade in small arms and light weapons, or organized criminal activity, or the deployment of UN peacekeepers, or the ideologies of, let's say, Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State infiltrating the continent. So those elements of continuity remain as well. And then fourth, non-state armed conflict. This has been pretty consistent in Africa since the 1990s. We haven't seen big increases or decreases. And it afflicts, in particular, the countries I put up there, DR Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Somalia, and the Sudans. Just those on their own account for about three quarters of all the non-state armed conflict we see in the, um, in the continent. And then elements of change. What do we see that's new at the moment? I would point briefly to five of those things. First of all is that, as I said, since 2010, all the lines are going up again on the conflict charts. We're seeing a resurgence of violence. Now, we're not up to the levels of the 1990s. It's, it's nowhere near that bad in terms of numbers of casualties and conflicts. But we are seeing an increase, and we're seeing an increase in the deliberate targeting of civilians as well. Second thing we're seeing that's relatively novel is popular protests. Levels of popular protests across the continent have increased quite dramatically. Um, since the mid-2000s and really dramatically since the Arab uprising in, um, in 2011. And this raises a question of the blurring between war and political protests. Where is the dividing line between when civil wars and rebellions start and popular protests end? Fourth, um, sorry, third is about the role of environmental factors. We're seeing, I think, more important issues to do with water, land, livestock, what Professor Scott Strauss calls livelihood struggles. These are normally localized, non-state armed conflicts fought over those issues of access to land, water, livestock, and the like. Fourth, then, a, a new trend, I think, we're seeing an increasing importance of religious dynamics on the continent. Now, that's mainly from a variety of groups that are claiming sort of Islamist credentials, yeah, with a sort of warped version of Islamic theology, uh, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and others. And then finally, what I talked about earlier, remote violence. We've seen a very large increase in the use of IED-related violence, also suicide bombing techniques in a number of theaters. Now, what does this mean? So what? Um, two things, I think, to, to finish. One question, or one so what, is about peacemaking. How do we um, try and end these wars and end this violence? I think the current trends are posing real problems for peacemaking. As I see it, since 1990, the most common approach has been what I would call power sharing. We try and end wars through negotiated settlements where we have a big tent approach to negotiations. We create transitional governance arrangements. And then at a later date, we hope to get a, um, an elected um, not transitory, but um, um, proper government. The problem we've seen is twofold. We've seen a number of participants in power sharing deals just not willing to share power, um, number one. And secondly, we've seen more extremist groups on the continent that are not even willing to negotiate in any recognizable terms about the politics of a particular settlement here. And what this has done, I think, is it's sorely tested the general inclination for quite inclusive peacemaking approaches um, on the continent, to the extent that now we see African organizations increasingly willing to refuse to negotiate with certain conflict parties. We are not trying to negotiate with Al-Shabaab in Somalia. We're not seriously trying to negotiate with Boko Haram. 
or AQIM or Ansar Dean or, or take your pick. Yeah? So an increasing reluctance to engage in peacemaking with certain illegitimate groups. As a result of which, I think the, the final problem here is that it raises questions of governance. If we're not going to negotiate, and we know that also it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to completely defeat groups like Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram. It leads us back to questions of governance and security sector reform and how do we demilitarize, basically, governance in those areas. Oh, sorry, I should have put that up earlier. Um, secondly, so what then, and to finish, peace operations. Peace operations have had some pretty tough times in Africa in the last 25 years, as we've seen a big shift from tra more traditional um, missions assisting the implementation of peace deals to many more conflicted and enforcement operations, whose mandate's now increasingly getting, I think, closer and closer to war fighting. Counterinsurgency, stabilization, even counterterrorism if we look at northern Mali and, um, and Somalia. And what that means is our peace operations require a whole different set of capabilities in order to be effective. It's not just infantry battalions that are key anymore, it's going to be about logistic support and medical and casualty evacuation support and military engineering and special forces and aviation and mobility and armoured protection and the like. So peace operations are becoming much more expensive. They're demanding many more capabilities as a result, and they're also raising, I think, big questions about doctrine. When there's no peace to keep, what exactly is the role of peace operations in those contexts? As we're seeing from Somalia and northern Mali, they're also getting more deadly as we have more combat with different factions. So what are the challenges here? I think just a very quick list. It's harder to be impartial when you're inserted into the middle of an ongoing war zone and you're actually targeting particular non-state actors, M23 in um, Congo or Al-Shabaab in Somalia. It's very, very difficult to get out exit strategies when your mandates are to protect civilians or build states. These are mandates almost without end. And so how do we get peace operations to leave? How do we deal with local level dynamics, which a lot of these conflicts involve? Well, it's very, very difficult for outsiders to do that, even from the region. And I think it will put a much bigger emphasis on the role of multidimensional operations and police in particular. Yeah? We need more police and civilian experts to do effective peace operations. And finally, um, issues of transnational organized crime. It's going to be very difficult for peace operations deployed in just one part of one country to have any way of really dealing with the transnational criminal networks that we see that are increasingly important for keeping not just rebel groups, but sometimes government um, forces going as well. So I'll, I'll end there. Okay.